Greetings, and welcome back to the Rose Bros Podcast. This episode, we are joined by Josh Young, Chief Investment Officer and Founder of Bison Interests, a Houston-based investment firm that focuses on the energy industry. Since inception, Bison Interests has returned approximately 130% to its clients as it actively invests in publicly traded equities. Josh has over 15 years of experience in investment management, 10 of which were focused on publicly traded oil and gas securities. Josh became chairman of the board of RMP Energy in 2017. After refreshing the board and management team and then rebranding the company to Ironbridge Resources, it was bought out at a 78% premium in 2018. Josh was a management consultant to Fortune 500 companies and private equity firms, and then an investment analyst at a private equity fund. He has worked as an energy investment analyst for a multi-billion dollar single-family office, which was nominated as Institutional Investors Single-Family Office of the Year in 2008. He also graduated with honors from the University of Chicago in economics. We sat down to discuss starting an energy fund, outperforming benchmarks, dividends versus buybacks, value traps, how to value an energy company, good prices versus good assets, the dangers of diversification, the outlook for natural gas, and the relevance of OPEC. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This podcast is sponsored by headracingcanada.com. Looking for high-performance ski gear this winter? In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is offering the lowest prices possible through its online storefront by passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. Well, why don't we begin? Sounds great. Josh Young, good afternoon. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. For the listener, you are the owner, founder, CEO of Bison Interests, a specialty niche energy investment fund. What is Bison Interests? Sure. So we launched Bison in 2015. Bison Interests is an investment advisor that advises one particular strategy, the Bison Energy Opportunity Fund, which invests in small cap publicly traded oil and gas companies. So we launched it in 2015 after the oil price crash. And the idea was we sort of knew it would be a mess for a while. And we named it bison because at least in uh, American sort of Western folklore, you know, the bison is the animal that faces into the storm and is able to get through it safer and faster when the other animals turn and run away. So we sort of knew it would be messy. I don't think we knew it would be as rough for as many years after we launched in 2015. But the idea was to, to face through it, deal with the challenges, understand that it would be tough, but also understand that we would get through it and that there would be significant rewards at the end. To back up a little, how did you get into investing in the first place? <laughs> a series of uh, <laughs> maybe not poor decisions, but sort of odd path. I used to read the newspaper as a kid. Uh, I was a really cool kid. And so every day I'd, I'd try to read the whole thing. There was a newspaper column called The Motley Fool. And so I would read that. Now it's a, you know, big website and they have all kinds of different finance related stuff. But at the time it was a newspaper column. And so I'd read their column and, and some other stuff as a, you know, teenager. And I started to invest in stocks as a teenager. I think it was in the late nineties. And so I always resonated with sort of uh, value and deep value, just understanding what a business did and buying it at a fraction of what I thought the business was worth. And. Eventually, I ended up working for a multi-billion dollar family office in Los Angeles a couple of years after I had graduated from school. And they were really interested in oil and gas, and they didn't really have anyone internally to help them. And I had owned some oil and gas stocks just randomly along with other value investments. And so I started to focus more on the sector at the time. And you know, I liked the people, and I liked the analysis, and I liked that it was focusing on companies with real assets that were 
tangible and sort of easier to understand than, you know, companies in biotech or other sorts of more esoteric fields. And so that's, uh, that's how I got into it. Did you have any value influences like say Howard Marks, Seth Klarman, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger? Or you, did you read a lot of those guys? Yeah, those some of those guys are up on my my wall. I think the the real kick in the butt to uh, get into investing professionally was actually I was at a private equity fund, a generalist private equity fund, helping them buy and fix businesses. I had done management consulting before that. It was sort of a logical transition, and I had an intern at the time who is now famous. And he and I basically sat in a room for three months and talked about value investing when we were supposed to be working on these uh, generalist uh, buyouts and, you know, fixing these companies. And so at the end of that, I ended up leaving the private equity firm and got a job doing value investing. And he went off and wrote a bunch of books and uh, is a, a famous finance commenter and columnist. Nowadays, how would you describe your investing style? Kind of a bank grant value approach, or is it a fast money day trader style, or what would you characterize yourself as? Yeah, I think I think I'm sort of doing what I think it's most similar to Oak Tree, except maybe you know sort of a deep value contrarian. We look a lot at metrics that other people sort of aren't as focused on, and typically have a multi year hold period, but are okay with investing in public equities without control. So we're not necessarily usually governing the companies we're investing in, just sort of finding things that are on a good trajectory that are misunderstood and buying them for pennies on the dollar in some cases relative to replacement cost or you know a significant discount to the current liquidation value of the business. Energy investing is a long way from Los Angeles slash Chicago, where you grew up and went to school. How did you get into energy specifically? Yeah, so so I started doing it at this family office in LA. And when we launched Bison, made the decision to move out to Houston to really get closer to the center of the industry. I just I noticed over time that there were there were information advantages that were available to folks living here or Denver or Calgary that you, know, you just didn't get as much living in LA. And so I uh, moved out here in 2016 and, you know, it was pretty remarkable going to various just social events and uh, people's family gatherings and stuff, meeting people in various parts of the energy industry, hearing about well results, hearing about royalty sales and other sorts of really interesting things is at just random events that you would never learn anything about the industry from if you were at similar things to that in LA or Chicago or other places. So, so there were real advantages from a geographic perspective, but in terms of focusing on the industry, I think really the oil price crash in 2014 was the catalyst where there were many small cap companies that traded down 80% or 90%. And generally, when a stock trades down that much, it's not precisely valued. It's not fairly valued at that price. It, you know, if a stock falls anywhere more than 70%, generally it's either a zero or it's worth way more than where it fell to. And it's just a question of what's it actually worth and then which one is going to revalue first what among the companies that fell, because typically it's not just one company falling 70% in a cyclical sector, it's sort of a whole set of them, you know, which one is best positioned to recover or to add significant value while it's depressed or while it's struggling from a, a cyclical downturn. Bison interests, the goal is to invest capital to make more capital, more money to make a return on investment. So you need money to begin with. Did you have to put your own money into Bison to get it going? Or was there a significant investment outside the company or how did it all start? Yeah. So so I launched it with a business partner who, who left after a few years. We thought it was going to be a few year opportunity where oil stocks were down 50% and small caps were down 80%. We figured we'd buy companies at at the time. We were buying companies for around four times EBITDA. They had about half market cap and half debt. So it'd be like two times market cap to EBITDA and two times debt to EBITDA. And the thought was that their overall value should double from where they had fallen because the typical one was down about 75%. And when the value would double, the market cap would triple or quadruple and we would sell and return capital. 
that was just sort of the high level, simple concept. And of course, we were doing very significant analysis on well results and replacement costs and liquidation value and sort of various other, depending on the specifics of the company and whether it was an upstream or services or midstream or whatever uh, company, there, there were lots of nuances, but just high level, the idea was we'd raise some money, deploy some of our own money, and then sell and return capital after a few years. And so unfortunately, what should have been or and looked like it would have been a cyclical downturn in 2015 with OPEC flooding the market and shale also flooding the market, there were multiple additional sort of shale discoveries and productivity improvements. And the situation with OPEC got worse, not better. And China slowed down. And, you know, there were various other sort of big things that were sort of hard to see at the the time of launch. And so, so yes, it started with me investing, my uh, co-founder uh, investing, and then outside money. And you know, over time, he moved on to my co-founder moved on to his passion, which was education. He was running a education nonprofit as well, and and started a education fundraising business, and and left Bison to to focus full time on on his passion. Had a large university endowment invest with us at the start of 2016, which was really helpful because, you know, oil and gas was very unpopular when we launched in 2015 and has gotten increasingly unpopular from an investment allocation perspective since then, especially in the U.S., especially among uh, sort of public equity fund managers and allocators to public equity funds. So some of my money, uh, some of other people's money, uh, for a little while, a lot of institutional money, but they pulled their money, that one endowment pulled their money in late 2020, which was sort of a <laughs> painful moment, both for our business as well as for that capital. Really, uh, I, I was very opposed to them doing it. And the, the usual way to do it is just someone says, hey, I want my money back. You say no problem and get it back to them in the contractual time frame. And you know, we did that, but there was some objection where it was like, hey, guys, you know, maybe you should wait a year. Here's why. Here's our top three positions and what we think is going to happen. And I understated how well those three positions would do, but they still did, you know, they did phenomenally well. And it was very unfortunate that they left, but uh, it was very helpful that they had invested for the many years that they were invested from 2016 to 2020. Energy is cyclical, a lot of ups and downs. If you had to structure your fund, maybe close it so that investors aren't, when they get scared and see oil go down five, 10% a day, they don't panic and try and get out of the fund or how have you structured it that way? Nope, not at all. We're, we're liquid and none of this is a offering or anything like that. I think it's helpful to, to share sort of how we approach things. And, you know, you, you interview a number of different fund managers and company executives. And so I think in that context, it's okay to share some stuff about this, but you know, we are running a private fund that's not sort of open generally to investment and only can accept qualified investors and all that all that stuff. But it's, it's, uh, I think it's okay to, to talk about this, I think, from an informational perspective, an educational perspective. So we haven't, we haven't done that. We've been very fortunate. You know, there are some people who have invested, who have withdrawn their money and, you know, this large institution invested and they unfortunately withdrew their money at a time that was very in, in, importune. But generally, my thought is having come out of a family office where, you know, people were locked up in their uh, investments in 2008 that, you know, it's people's money. And if we're able to deliver back money without it materially affecting everyone else's investment, then we should do so. And so, you know, whether stocks are high or low, as long as there's not some sort of big tax reason or big sort of strategic reason, the, the goal is just to, you know, respect that it's someone's money. And if they make the decision to, to withdraw, to, to allow them to, uh, we've been fortunate though, I think people sort of generally understand when they're investing in an oil and gas fo focused equity fund that there's going to be a lot of volatility. And then especially recently, as we've been able to show, I mean, it, <laughs> it's no longer a new fund, right? We like launched the strategy in 2015. We've been able to show very material outperformance versus benchmarks and frankly, versus almost every other there's not very many left, but versus basically every other fund that focuses or firm that focuses on oil and gas public equities. And so I think that's been helpful in terms of getting people to, if they invest, to to remain invested. And then I think it's also been attractive. You know, it's a very volatile space. So it, it's not a very attractive space for people who need to have the value in their fund rise slowly, but 
basically the, the return stream is the opposite of uh, Madoff sort of 1% a month sort of thing. So institutions all want that for some reason, it seems. And wealthy individuals, typically entrepreneurs, people who have made a lot of money taking some amount of risk and sort of understanding the vagaries of, of business and markets, find what we're doing really interesting. And so generally those people, when they see a pullback, are interested in investing more money rather than in, in pulling their money. But that's generally sometimes sometimes it's unfortunate, but the reality is it's their money and they can have it if they if they want it, even if it's a bad time. After fees, it's very hard to outperform the market. Transaction costs, all the fees associated with being an investor. And as a result, not many investors outperform the market. Has being a niche energy investor allowed you to spot mispriced opportunities that have helped you to outperform markets along the way? I think so. I think, I think it's, it's this sort of trade off where staying small is helpful, where, you know, there's been opportunities to raise a lot more money, but sort of deviate from the strategy of small cap focused upstream oil and gas and, you know, secondarily services and midstream. There, there have been opportunities to raise more money and maybe collect more management fees or some other sort of. I guess like in music or other artistic stuff, it would be selling out, but you know, we're in finance. So like in theory, you're supposed to make more money, do whatever to make more money. But my thought has always been to try to maximize returns rather than try to maximize firm size or fund size or fees that I collect. I'm, I'm pretty just focused on, and it's tough because sometimes it doesn't matter what you do when you're down a lot in a month, even when oil and gas stocks aren't. And there are other times where you feels like you can do no wrong and everything goes up a lot. But yeah, I think, I think it really helps to stay focused on, on what we're doing and to stay sort of within the circle of competence that, that, uh, we've cultivated. And I think it really helps that oil and gas is hated. And it's just, it's so weird to see a sector to have done this well and then still see institutions running and pulling money, still seeing most investors, whether it's private money or institutions or endowments or investment banks, whatever it is, there, it's still, there's still not a lot of uh, love for the sector and there's a lot of hate. And so the more hate, uh, it's sort of like the Emperor Palpatine thing where he's trying to recruit Luke Skywalker and it's like, let the hate flow through you. Like to some extent, uh, the more hate there is for a sector, the more opportunities there are to outperform over time. So it's tough as a business manager and owner, but it's also fantastic as an investor because, you know, we're really in the shallow end of the pool and there's really not a lot of competition for finding these great opportunities that just require a little bit of diligence to figure out. If I'm correct, you were a graduate of the University of Chicago, which has a strong emphasis or it used to place a strong emphasis on the efficient markets theory. Investing in an abandoned sector like the energy sector, you've probably spot, like we said, mispriced opportunities. Have you kind of had to change your thinking on efficient markets as you've invested in the energy sector and learned things along the way? Or how, how have you thought of it that way? Yeah. So so one of the the sort of interesting things is if you even when you look at the efficient market hypothesis, there's always sort of like an edge to a theory like that. And so you would expect that large liquid securities that are well covered by investment banks and that have many buy side analysts and investment funds that can own them or can short them would be priced extremely efficiently. And then as you go towards smaller securities, as you go towards less liquid securities, as they have various attributes that are make them less investable for various reasons, you're going to, according to the efficient market hypothesis, you're actually going to see less efficient pricing. So people often say, oh, well, XYZ thing means that their markets aren't efficient, but the further away you are from those large, liquid, well-followed things, the more likely it is, even from an efficient market hypothesis perspective, that you're going to find inefficiencies. So, you know, when you're dealing with small cap equities in a sector that's being divested, uneconomically divested from by institutions, allocators, and private investors and funds um, in order to maintain their fees. I mean, this fo all follows incentive theory. Like it makes sense that people are, are doing this to a large extent because they're responding to their personal economic incentives. But it also actually sort of weirdly, you know, the statistics are that you basically as an active manager can't really outperform a benchmark by more than a few years, by more than a little bit, and that there's almost always very powerful mean reversion. But, you know, I think, I think 
it shouldn't be surprising that there would be material outperformance over time in a small cap public equity sector. Again, even with that efficient market hypothesis. But the, the really strange thing is, so you meet people who believe this from an allocator perspective, and they'll even allocate a lot of money to private equity funds that tell them this. And so they'll pay enormous fees, right? They'll pay management fees and incentive fees and deal fees and advisory fees and like just tons of fees. But they won't invest in an active manager in a space that's less competitive, right? Where there's fewer, because there's many, many s- small private equity funds now going in lower middle market deals. The same institutions and the same allocators will put tons of money into this one side of things where they're paying lots of fees and they won't put money into small cap public equities in general. And then specifically oil and gas is extra taboo because of ESG. So it's a, it's this very weird. There's almost like cognitive dissonance or like just a weird setup where, where there's non, so non-optimal capital allocation. And so on one hand, it can be very upsetting because, hey, why aren't they chasing this excess return, which is their job? And on the other hand, it's like, well, hey, if they're not going to do that, more for me and more for my clients who are willing to sort of look past the things that these guys don't like in order to to capture those excess returns. One worry of contrarian investors and people who like value plays is you kind of get caught in a value trap where the stock looks cheap and maybe is cheap, but never seems to go up. Have you had to push for dividends or share buybacks to make sure that the, your investments start to pay off? How do you think of it that way? Do you just bide your time and let the results speak for themselves? So I think it's a that's a great question. I think it's really complicated. I think value traps are very broad. Sometimes it's that value investors are wrong and they buy something that they think is cheap, but it was cheap for a reason. And it's not actually as discounted versus its real business value as they thought. And that business value that they thought is degrading, it's impermanent, it's there's some other problem or set of problems that they missed. So yes, sometimes I make mistakes and buy things that are like that, just like everyone. And hopefully I learn from my mistakes and I make fewer of them going forward. And sometimes I do go pretty active with companies, I took control of a Canadian EMP and sold it. I went to visit their operations. It was a RMP Energy, which we renamed after we replaced the management team and board and then sold assets and sold it. I ended up on their board because I went to visit their assets in 2016, the winter of 2016, it was 30 below zero. And I don't remember if it was 30 uh, Fahrenheit or 30 uh, Celsius, but either way, it was really cold. And they sort of converge, I think, close to there. So the operations were were sort of disorganized. You could even tell just visiting the well sites for RMP versus down the street, Hammerhead and Velvet were just sort of much better organized. You could tell there were some organizational and management issues, unfortunately. And there had been some health issues from the management team and there and at the board, and there was significant dissension. And so it was a situation where it was a value trap and there was an opportunity to sort of turn it around. And so I ended up joining the board, very rapidly getting control of the board and taking the steps that I thought were necessary in order to extract value. And you know, we ended up selling it for about a 20% premium to where the stock was trading the day I joined the board, which was great because the average company in the Motney in the area that the, that RMP was active, their stocks were down about 50% in that time. And small caps that were in similar situations to RMP, their stocks were down around 70% during that time. So up 20 versus down 70 was pretty, was pretty great. Haven't done anything exactly like that since then. Uh, looked at doing something like that recently, but there wasn't, it, it wasn't as conducive to sort of extreme change, but may, may do that again. Sometimes it's intentional, right? You find something that needs fixing, but also has extra upside because it needs fixing, but you know, that's very labor intensive and there's extra risks associated with that. So not saying we won't do it in the future, but haven't done it since then. I guess it's been a few years now since, uh, since it went active. Everyone's always debating dividends versus buybacks, but in your opinion, is there a right way to go or does it just depend on the asset and the management team and the commodity cycle and times? So I don't think it's always just those two. So I think there's a, you know, there's a time for and a situation for dividends. There's a time and situation for buybacks. Sometimes it makes sense to do both. 
Sometimes it makes sense to do accretive acquisitions and to focus on that. Sometimes it makes sense to focus on development of assets and, and growing production or delineating assets or doing exploration. I think there's a variety of different capital allocation choices for companies and for boards to approve. And I think it really just depends on the situation to figure out what the best path is. And there can often be friction when many of the shareholders think one thing and the company and the board do something different. And I think it's it's just, I think there's some amount of discovery. And then there's also some amount of incentive theory where sometimes boards and management teams are not appropriately incentivized or boards don't do a good job of appropriately incentivizing their their management teams to do the sort of most value creating activity and that that's where there are opportunities for activists or frankly just good opportunities to sell stocks and <laughs> redeploy capital where um where there's more value creation but i don't think i don't think it's just a pure one or the other sort of choice and you know, one example of that would be a Canadian company journey, which I own stock in and just using it for this, for this example where they have not been returning capital. They've been doing acquisitions. And over the last three years, I think they're either the best performing or one of the best performing Canadian traded oil and gas stocks. And partly they, they started out really cheap, but also they've been opportunistic in their acquisitions. And even though they've paid $0 in dividends and done zero buybacks in the last three years, they've actually issued stock to do acquisitions and to, to fund repayment of some of the debt from those acquisitions, their stock has outperformed. So as an example of something that we own that works, and I think it's hard. I think people sometimes get in a mindset of, oh, I need to be receiving capital back from these companies. But I think what really matters is the increase in net asset value per share, not like a sort of fake real estate assessment style net asset value, but a real improvement in intrinsic value. And if you can improve intrinsic value through acquisitions better than you can through share buybacks or, you know, realization through dividends, uh, it's, it's better for you to do acquisitions similar with, with development, where if you can grow your intrinsic value through delineation and development of an asset, maybe you should do that instead of buying back stock. I think that the problem is that almost always companies do the opposite of what they should be doing. So companies that should be buying back stock pay dividends, um, companies that should be doing buybacks and dividends, engaging growth plans. I don't know. It's sort of, it's a little bit of a mess. And, uh, I think a lot of what I do is trying to filter through all that and find companies that are doing what I think they should be doing. And if I'm right, then those companies can outperform versus their peers. In terms of valuing an energy company, are there certain metrics that are more important than the others? For instance, reserves or cash flow or the management leading the company. Is there one or two things you look towards? Yeah, I think, I think probably the most important question is uh, some combination of what's the replacement cost of the business and assets and what's the liquidation value. And you know, there are various other metrics that are important, but I think they can sometimes be misleading. So one that's been very popular across the border. So both the US and Canada has been uh, free cash flow yield. And I think that actually doesn't really tell you a whole lot about a cyclical business because it might a company might look like it's very cheap on free cash flow, but the market might be pricing that because there's an expectation of that cash flow falling or capital requirements increasing or limited sustainability of that cash flow. Um, similarly, EBITDA multiples on an enterprise value basis, they're, they're, these are easy heuristics, but frequently those similar to free cash flow yield are incomplete descriptions. Uh, they're, they're, they're nice heuristics, but they're not, they're not comprehensive. And also, you know, proved reserves, same sort of idea. There's lots of assumptions that are baked in to proved reserves. Proved producing reserves are helpful too, but often costs escalate and quantities decline. And so you end up with them being in, you know, they're, they're helpful. What I found is, you know, focusing more on liquidation value and trajectory of it along with replacement cost and replacement cost is maybe more relevant on the oil field services side, or at least easier to calculate, but it also can vary, right? Uh, costs for steel or costs for various other components or labor can rise or fall depending on the various cycles and availability. And so, these things are are complex and they're they're not static. 
which, which makes them, I think, harder to explain and harder to sort of put in sort of neat charts that can be used for marketing, but I think are very important in considering investments. And, and I think, I think one, one exercise that's helpful is looking at what past measures were for companies and then how their stocks performed subsequently. And when you back test some of these measures, I think it's helpful in terms of understanding what to actually use and then how to balance these different measures in weighing attractiveness of different businesses. In terms of measuring your success or your scorecard, I think I read that you use the energy index fund as kind of your benchmark, but the whole point of the vice interest is to earn a shareholder return. Is there a kind of a benchmark hurdle rate that you fall back on 10, 20% on a given basis? Or how do you think of it that way? Not really. I think, I think the goal is to outperform the broader market in addition to oil and gas stocks. And I guess secondarily my competitors, um, but I don't, we don't, we, we thought about using a, a hurdle rate when we were launching Bison. And the problem was that we couldn't figure out what the right hurdle rate was to use. And, you know, I think, I think we were right that there was a lot of uncertainty in terms of the path of oil and gas stocks. So for example, since we launched in 2015, XOP, which is this sort of very common ETF used to measure, you know, large cap oil and gas producers is down. I think as of the end of January from when we launched in the middle of May of 2015, it was down about 31%. And there had been 2% of dividends or something like that in that whole time. So maybe it was down net 29% net of the costs and trading expenses and all of that. And so, you know, when you think about what's the right hurdle for not losing 30% of your money over seven and a half years, I don't know. That's a, there's not really a good, I think, theoretical finance answer or economic answer. I think obviously you want to compound your money over time, but you also want to not lose money. And so our focus is really, we, we, we choose not to use a hurdle because we're really just focused on making money and, and, and avoiding permanent capital impairment. And so we felt that using a 6% or 8% or 10%, whatever hurdle would inappropriately focus people on that rate rather than, you know, being able to be up hundreds of percent in a year, or you're just avoiding some amount of loss in certain years where there were, you know, really bad years in, in the last seven. And so I think it's a good question. And obviously one hopes to outperform, I mean, interest rates now are what, 5% or so. So, so you obviously want to outperform the, the risk-free rate, but you know, they were close to zero for a time. And I think they were 2% or so when we launched. So I don't know. I think, I think it's a, it's a good question, but it's not really something that we, we're, we're just trying to do well for people without trying to beat a sort of imaginary hurdle, either being an index or particular rate of return. As a active energy fund, your scorecard is currently outperforming the energy index, but when the cycle turns or when things aren't so good, how do you structure the portfolio so that investors are protected on the downside so that when things go down, you're not burned too badly? Do you think of it that way or is there steps you take? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we do is try to own shares of companies that don't go bankrupt. <laughs> And so we'll generally, uh, that, that's, I guess, the biggest thing. The second biggest thing is paying a large discount to replacement cost. And in some cases, getting to buy companies at large discounts to their liquidation value is helpful too, because it just, it does limit your, your downside. And, and there's different ways to structure that, whether it's companies that have low cash flow break evens or whether it's companies that have hedging in place at the company level to protect against a falling commodity price whether it's just buying something that's very, very cheap relative to the oil or gas production or the rigs they own or other equipment, whether it's getting some after the crash in 2014, there were a number of uh, EMP companies that owned office buildings or pipelines or gas processing plants. And the, the rush to leave the space was so significant that you could buy companies in some cases for the value of their real estate and get their oil and gas for free. Or, you know, it, they could own a lot of power generation and be ramping that up and essentially get that for free. And so th that sort of approach, I guess it's almost sort of like a deep value approach, really trying to make sure that there's multiple paths to, to value realization 
I think is really helpful in a downturn. It's not helpful for short-term mark-to-market performance. These stocks can go wild in, in every direction. And there's a lot of volatility that gets experienced by individual stocks in the oil and gas space, as well as by funds that are trying to own a portfolio of them. But where I've seen people try to time the market and try to short or sell heavily ahead of some sort of downturn, I haven't seen people achieve a lot of success with that. Mostly from where I've seen market timing efforts, I've seen people either lose a lot of money because they sell at a big loss because they're worried about a further loss or miss out on making a lot of money because they sell after a 20% gain and then a stock goes up another 200% or something like that. So avoiding avoiding that sort of mechanistic risk management approach and really trying to risk manage through portfolio construction and security selection has been has been helpful for us. And it, it is interesting. I mean, like we'll intentionally buy stocks that are hated. Like the the worse people react to us talking about owning something, generally the better I feel about owning it. If I talk about something and everyone's like, oh yeah, that's a great company. Maybe I bought the wrong thing. But but that's not really tied to downside protection. I'll give an example for a company from like 20 years ago or 10 years ago, Forest Oil, right? It was loved. People thought they were great. They had this big play in Texas, but also went into Oklahoma too. the granite wash. And then there was an Oklahoma portion of that too. And people loved the stock and it was considered to be a really good sort of smid cap, mid cap uh, that had been around for a long time, was very stable. And within two years, I think it went from being a sort of mid cap to essentially bankrupt or nearly bankrupt. And uh, Exco was another one that was like that, which was they were a big competitor to Cabot here in the US. And I don't know if these names will sound familiar to you or whatever, but these were companies that were enormous. And they, they actually traded, there was a time where they had the same market valuation and same enterprise value as Cabot. And Cabot maintained their roughly $10 billion market cap enterprise value and Exco went from, I think it was around that $10 billion value to zero, it went bankrupt and the bondholders got almost nothing on their value. And so, and these were companies, I think on emergence from the financial crisis, Deutsche Bank's number one pick, they used to have a, a great uh, oil and gas uh, research team at, at the time. And their number one pick for the recovery play was Exco Resources, which went bankrupt short, I mean, not shortly after, but a few years later. So I think, you know, the companies that people love and that they think are safe and they're comfortable with paying a premium valuation for, at least in some cases I've seen in my career, have uh, gone to zero or experienced significant capital loss. So, you know, I think one of the things that people maybe misunderstand about value strategies is they think, oh, well, you own this thing that has this identifiable problem, therefore you're taking more risk. But more often than not, if there are identifiable problems and they're well known, especially if a stock is hated and perceived as problematic, there's likely to be a significant discount associated with the value of that stock. And you might be actually getting it at a safer price, uh, you know, a safer point than buying something that's loved and, you know, viewed as sort of safe and a good way to accumulate value. Like we were saying, the markets are not always efficient, but most people agree that they are largely efficient. So the hard part, I guess the Howard Marks quote would be making sure you're buying a good asset for the right price. Do you have certain ways of looking at companies or certain things that stick up when you're looking for the difference between a good asset and a good price? Do you have to kind of sift through things? Because a lot of times everybody knows a good company. So the tricky part is finding it for the good price. Are there certain times that present opportunities or certain opportunities that you look for in, in distressed oil and gas investing? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've looked at some of the stuff that Oak Tree has owned in oil and gas, and I'm not sure that anyone would call it good, the good assets. And I would argue that Bison, similarly, some of the things that we'll buy are things that many, either in the industry or many observers, wouldn't necessarily call good. I think it's it's more about buying something that's acceptable or on an improving trajectory at a great price and sort of making real estate folks say this a lot. And I think some private equity people do too, sort of making the money on the buy. So trying to, to buy something at such an attractive price 
that there are a lot of different things that could happen that could still result in a profitable investment. And again, it's less about is the company good, is the asset good, and less less about that and more just is it less bad than people think? Is there something about it that's going to help it realize more value? Is there a lower decline rate than people are thinking? Is there a power generation business? Is there some real estate or pipelines or gas processing or leases in some other area that could potentially be sold for a lot? So yeah, I, I think I think one of the things that we sort of struggle with, I think, in communicating what we're doing is every investment that we'll make is is really different. We, we sort of take take every position, any potential investment and evaluate it versus everything in our portfolio, all its competitors, every transaction we can find that's relevant and and really consider it. I mean, when we're including the portfolio, we're considering the portfolio aspects of of that particular position versus the other positions and sort of whether it makes the portfolio stronger and more durable and improves the, the risk profile as well as the return profile. But every individual company that we're considering, we evaluate fully on its own merits with its own investment thesis. So we might own company because it owns some real estate and has like okay-ish assets in XYZ oil basin in the US or Canada, and then own a different company that's rapidly growing their production in a different basin with a different commodity mix. Maybe it's more gas or more oil. And, you know, they might look like very different valuation profiles and different management teams and different investment theses. And to some extent, that's intentional, right? It's helpful to not own a bunch of companies all doing the same thing that are all tied to the same sort of uh, commodity price drivers and same asset market and so on. And so, you know, I think it's uh, the, the downside of that is it's very hard. It's not all companies that are paying dividends that are high current free cash yield or high share repurchases or, you know, all in the Permian or all in the Motney or whatever. It's, it's just a complex strategy of going and sifting through and trying to find things that we think are very differentiated and both are priced ridiculously low and are on a trajectory to realize a much higher price either in the asset market or in the public market. Modern portfolio theory would suggest you need to diversify. You need to have 20, 30, 40 stocks in order to protect yourself against downside risk. How do you think of it in terms of running concentrated portfolios so that you can, in fact, outperform the market and have higher returns than, than the market itself? Do you have a large number of stocks or is your portfolio quite small? Yeah. So there was a Buffett quote I read recently. I might have shared it on Twitter too, where Buffett was talking about how there are certain stocks and certain opportunities that you find where if you only put 20% of your net worth in it, you're making a lifetime mistake. Like, uh, I forget exactly how he phrased it, but basically your foregone profits are life changing. Uh, or, you know, if you size it up more, they're life changing. So on one hand, I totally agree with Buffett. And I think it's really important when you find things that are amazing to size them up. On the other hand, Part of my deal with my clients and being able to provide liquidity when they want on a quarterly basis is to not have everything in one stock. And so we're pretty concentrated, but we're generally not getting over, we try to not get over 10% of the money in the strategy in any particular stock. And we'll, we'll cap out generally at 20% sort of on the very high end in terms of cost getting into a stock. And then as, as it runs, generally the expectation is that we would trim on the way up. So we're not 50% or 80% or something in one stock. The flip side is it's, it's not, it's not really mechanistic. It's not like we're trying to only have three stocks or only have a hundred stocks. There's sort of a flux in the portfolio in terms of the number of names. So I think the least number of names we've had uh, has been 11 or 12 and the most we've had has been 30 or 40, but it sort of, it varies. And then we'll also, w w we used to not talk about this so much. You know, obviously we tell our clients and they were aware of it, but it was, it was always hard to explain, but we have a, a risk basket of about 10% or so of the strategy where we'll put it into companies or opportunities where there's a potential, let's say 10 X or 20 X, but there's also a risk of permanent capital loss. And 
you know, people misread, I think, Buffett and Marx and some of these other folks and think that they don't do it, but they do it a lot. And, you know, you really want to be careful, I think, when you're taking a risk of permanent capital impairment, but, and, and size it appropriately. And, and thus, that's where we end up with, let's say 20 of our positions might be these half a percent or so, but potential 10x or 50x or whatever uh, sort of positions. But I think it's really important to be able to do that because that sort of exposure can allow for excess return, but it also allows for holding sort of maybe a little more boring core positions where they don't need to have the maximum upside if oil prices rise or if gas prices rise or if rig rates rise. It's not necessary to capture all of that in the the core portfolio. So we're able to sort of get some of this real sort of right tail exposure and in some cases left tail exposure through through a, a, a basket that's at a that has a, a size limit but where we're able to take some of these sort of extra risks. So size limiting that helps a lot in terms of of limiting the total losses potential to the strategy, but it also allows for sort of extra return and allows for capitalizing on certain opportunities. I mean, even among the limited number of funds and limited number of investors active in oil and gas, there are almost none who are willing to take that risk of permanent capital impairment. So <laughs> it gets even into a more ridiculously small competitive basket. And and that's uh, that's where I like to play. Do you hold any cash for any of the investors that may need their money tomorrow or today and that need to get out now? Or is it all is it all in stocks? We, we do uh, quarterly redemptions for, for our clients. So, you know, as if there's a quarter where there's less money coming in than going out, we'll make sure that we have cash available to be able to, to fund that. But, you know, excluding, excluding sort of the just technicalities around running a, a fund where it's necessary to sort of have that sort of thing or, you know, running a strategy like that, we'll, we'll flex the cash position up or down depending on how extremely compelling opportunities are at any given moment. So right now, for example, we have a very low cash position. We found a few securities recently that we have opportunities that that just were overwhelmingly compelling and where we just put some of the remaining cash balance in and understand that there's some extra risk in running a small cash balance uh, because there might be other things that get even more compelling. But I think the job is just to find things where there's an opportunity that's sufficiently attractive, I think it makes sense to to allow a cash position to to run down a little in order to be able to get that exposure. And then a couple of our positions have started to pay dividends or return capital in other ways where we're actually getting, this is sort of new for us and it wasn't really, we weren't buying the companies for this, but hey, we'll take it. So with that cash getting thrown back at us, we're in a little bit of a different position from a liquidity perspective where we're able to get some extra cash to buy stuff if they're, well, we're going to get it either way, but it sort of frees up the necessity of holding quite as much cash as we might have otherwise. Some funds are limited by their, I guess you could say client base where a lot of people like needing to retire or need the cash tomorrow. Have you found it advantageous to kind of have the high risk investor or maybe the investor willing to take the oil and gas risks as clients? Has it been an advantage for you in the fund? I mean, I love my clients. I don't know that there's one particular, I think the, the, mo- the thing that's most common across the client base for Bison are people who have made their money themselves. And they typically are business people who are either retired or actively running their business or businesses. And they understand, I think, the, the volatility that goes into running a business and they understand the potential returns from accepting volatility and doing things that are pretty unpopular. So I don't know that it's necessarily a life cycle uh, or life stage that necessarily is a differentiator for Bison clients versus not. I think it's more just, I think it's really hard to allocate other people's money into a strategy that's volatile, even if that's the one that's most likely for them to have a high return over a multi-year period. And so I think it's really just, are you an employee or are you a principal? And if you're a principal, having more money in a few years is generally more attractive. And if you're an employee, having your job in a few years is more attractive. And so, you know, I mean, it's not, 
totally fair. We do have some family office clients and, you know, I think people sometimes unfortunately have to take career risk to some extent to make the best investments that they make. But the best allocators, I think, have conversations with their clients and have the same sort of idea of like a risk bucket where they allocate from. And, you know, I think, uh, I think one of the problems is that, you know, some of the big university endowments do this and just never talked about it. And so as everyone else like copies the Yale model, for example, they miss the part <laughs> where those guys would do stuff like this. I think it makes sense for allocators to do it, but I don't think it's that common. And I think, you know, there's generally just a, a preference to do what everyone else is doing. And to if you don't stand out too much, you're not likely to get fired. Switching gears a little bit, you're not a forecaster and you don't have a crystal ball, but in terms of the actual commodities, what's your thoughts on natural gas these days? It's been on a bit of a slide lately and tough times. Are you optimistic on the commodity or how do you think of it? So I'm very bullish on natural gas going out a few years and I'm pretty bearish on natural gas over the next, let's say, 18 months. And so where I have exposure to natural gas, it's almost entirely in businesses where they're cheap just based on the cash flow from or activity or whatever from the oil side of their business and where I get their gas essentially for free. And so I could imagine actually scaling up that sort of exposure over the next 18 months to the extent that those sorts of businesses get more heavily discounted. But I think there's a unusual opportunity to buy companies that have a lot of gas reserves and potential or actual gas production without having to pay very much for that right now. I just don't know when that changes. So it's not something I'm necessarily scaling up right now. But, you know, I think, I think there's a good chance as, you know, in Canada, LNG Canada is supposed to come on in the next couple of years. Maybe it'll come on in three years, but you know, that, that sort of uh, idea and same thing in the U.S. where over the next two years, there should be a couple of big projects and then a number of smaller ones coming on with more to come in 2026 and 2027. And so as that happens, I think there's a good chance that natural gas prices recover to levels like we saw last year. If one is to hold a natural gas company that can survive a period of low gas prices, either because they also produce oil or because they're a low cost producer, it could potentially be very rewarding. But you know, I'm not out there buying predominantly gas producer stocks here and I think there could be significant downside because the market does tend to be sort of shorter term oriented, particularly in the oil and gas space where there aren't as many value investors focused on it and where there's not as much sort of long term money in the space right now. In Canada, the natural gas producers have been extremely frustrated. You can't get gas to market. And when they do, it's oftentimes at a very low price. One comment that's come up is that U.S. will buy from Canada, sell it at a higher price on the international market. As a U.S.-based investor, does that worry you when you're investing in Canada? Does that kind of scare off your capital or do you see opportunity in that? Coming from a U.S. perspective, how do you view the current problem in Canada on the low natural gas prices? Yeah, I think... I think there's something totally different that's happening. I'll, I'll take a risk here and just talk about what I've heard and seen. And this is very different from what you'll hear, I think, from basically anyone, because I think people are intimidated. And what happened in Canada is that, yeah, there should have been pipelines built, and that's on the government, and it's terrible. But there were large producers who it looks like glutted the market in order to be able to go buy assets for pennies on the dollar. And so, you know, I was hurt by it a little from a couple of positions I was in, but also I met with these companies and they would tell you in private one-on-one -on -one meetings what they were doing. And it was wild um, and it's still happening. And, you know, you don't have to look very far. Look at the top 10 producers for gas in Canada. And there are a number of companies where they're structurally growing into a capacity constrained market. So if you're growing in a supply constrained market, you are the problem. And if you pretend like you're not the problem, you're just pretending you've been doing like some of these companies have been doing it for years. And, and, you know, some companies that were, that were growing uneconomically went bankrupt. You know, there were some smaller producers that were sort of bad actors in a similar manner, but you know, it was mostly large producers who were, whether they'd say it publicly or privately were squeezing their competitors in order to 
by companies. And in, in many cases, it was like super bad, at least from a US perspective, where, you know, they'd have like crossover and boards of directors, they'd, you know, have their normal financial advisor go advise the seller, and magically, they end up owning the asset after the downturn. But you know, there's a few large gas producers, they've behaved, I think, in a way that is inconsistent with what they say publicly. And it's not uneconomic for them, because they can take the short amount, the temporary pain, and end up with way more assets at way lower prices than it would have cost them if they just uh, behaved in a sort of rational manner. And then it's not 100% on them because there were also these smaller producers that essentially bankrupted themselves or you know destroyed their values to a large extent by uneconomically growing. So I think there's a narrative, right? There's a, a political narrative of, hey, you know, we need more pipelines and, and, you know, the, com- the country should have more oil and gas pipelines. It's a real shame that they weren't built and that's on the voters and, uh, you know, the politicians. But I don't think things had to be nearly as bad for the industry. And I think it's almost like there was like reverse collusion where the gas producers went out and <laughs> drilled more to produce more and grow more to squeeze their competitors to be able to buy them. And then, you know, the midstream companies to some extent, I think participated with some of the the maintenance schedules where magically local gas prices would go negative for a few months a year at times where there's actually decent demand. And then somehow those, those midstreamers also end up with these great contracts with some of the large producers. I don't know. I mean, it just looks sort of bad and uh, is, is very unfortunate and is something that from what I can tell people in Canada are just too intimidated by these companies to, to be willing to talk about it. So, Hey, I'm sitting in Houston. I'll talk about it. It's terrible. They shouldn't do it. And it's something, it's actually one thing. I think that the future for Canadian natural gases is much worse than the future for us natural gas because of this issue. I think the, Canadian gas situation could be glutted for a long time. And these same companies that are growing their production for gas at $2 gas or $3 gas, they're going to keep growing it. And, you know, LNG Canada is going to be great for Canada, but it's not going to be great, I think, for Western Canada because they'll just grow 10% or 15% a year. And, you know, you look at all the permits that are coming on, permits for wells that are going to be coming on in British Columbia, and you're just going to see I mean, there's a lot of good resource, but I think it gets developed likely in a way, I don't think like this time is different. So I think it ends up getting developed in a way that's similar to how it's been developed so far, which is that producers drill so much that they flood the market. And there's going to be the same sort of pressures where they'll want to go buy XYZ producer that has an asset next to theirs for you know a fraction of the intrinsic value. And the way to do that is to intermittently glut the market get maintenance programs to force prices even lower than they would be from the glut and then get to go buy those assets for a discount. So I know that's like probably the most <laughs> bearish and the uh, negative uh, story that you might've heard about it, but that that's what I saw and that's what I see happening there. So, so my exposure to Canadian gas producers is quite limited and usually it's uh, companies that also have significant oil production or other assets. From a Canadian perspective, it's almost embarrassing and how inefficient the market seems to us. But as a supplier of capital from the U.S., it sounds like the problem is a little more nuanced from a, an American perspective than than what we might think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it's it's more nuanced. I think there's. I think when you look at sort of who picks up the the flag for hey, there's th- these people are the problem. Generally, they have some bias or you know, and again, like. I've lost money through what I saw happening along these lines in various companies before. So maybe I'm biased because I experienced this, but also experiencing it, I think, gives some insight into what may happen next. And, you know, one of the things I try to do is if I do make a mistake, which I make mistakes just like everyone else, I try to not repeat the same mistakes. And so I guess having experienced this as I look out, as I see what the companies are saying versus what they're doing and activity levels and budgets and likely well productivity and likely production from these different fields, uh, it does look like there's a decent chance that there will be a significant oversupply in Western Canada. In the US also, like there should be fewer rigs running right now in let's say the Haynesville, but there's less, I think there's less of a problem here 
from a multi-year perspective where as these LNG projects come on, there should be enough capacity to be able to export all the gas that's going to be on in, let's say, 2026. So I'm pretty bullish U.S. gas and I think just less so for Canadian gas. In contrast, does the U.S. market strike you as a great opportunity and the gas market is efficient compared to Canada? I think it's more efficient. Again, I think I think there, there are operators here who are probably drilling too many wells. I just think it's less predatory. It's not like XYZ gas producer that's drilling with, let's say, 10 rigs or eight rigs in the Haynesville that should be drilling with five rigs is out there trying to buy the one that was running two rigs and now is running zero and going to get them at a 50% discount because they run those extra rigs and force the local price to zero or something. Like it's just not, it's just not happening. Whereas that's happened in Canada and seems to be setting up to maybe happen again. So I think it's sort of just a different dynamic. And then. You know, when you fast forward, let's say two or three years, you're going to have an extra, what is it, like somewhere between five and 10 BCF a day of export capacity in the US. And if you look at the likely trajectory of production growth and just overall US production, as well as uh, the trajectory for power burn and exports to Mexico and so on, there does seem to be, it's going to actually be a little hard for US producers to grow their production as much as exports and export capacity is going to grow. Again, contrasting that with Canada, where LNG Canada, even if you give it credit for phases one and two, that's maybe, what is it, one BCF, two BCF? There's, I mean, there's almost that amount of oversupply now in Canada. And so it just doesn't, it doesn't really solve the problem. You'd need four or five BCF coming on, but you're not, Coastal Link isn't getting built, the, the pipeline to uh, LNG Canada isn't getting built with enough capacity to to transport four or five BCF a day of gas, and then LNG Canada isn't getting built to to export that amount. And so there's this risk where it would solve if it turned on today, it would solve the oversupply problem in Canada right now. But by the time it gets finished and comes on, you'll have all these wells that are permitted right now in British Columbia having been drilled, completed, and on production, you'll have an extra, let's say, 2 BCF a day of production. So you'll be no better positioned. You might actually be worse positioned two years from now, absent a significant slowdown in, in development on the gas side in Canada. You might be worse positioned than, than you are right now. So yeah, export capacity will rise, but production likely rises more. And then it rises more even among the producers who aren't oriented towards West Coast LNG production. So there's a whole set who are still very actively growing their gas production in, in the Alberta Montany and in other sort of similar plays. There's still a lot of development in the deep basin for dry gas. And <laughs> I don't know why. They, I mean, you know, again, like there are some producers that might be able to take advantage and go buy their competitors. There are some who just, you know, I think look at the single well economics and make the decisions on, on that basis. But in the end, you end up with what you saw, I think, over the last five years, which was a pretty rough time for Canadian gas producers. Some investors would consider OPEC to be unable to control price nowadays. Do you have an opinion on OPEC, on their ability to keep the floor on the prices of oil? Have you been thinking of it at all? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think I think the thing that actually messed up the oil market in the last couple of months has been the weather. And yeah, like the weather hasn't been great for natural gas and that's where people have been focused, but there's a million barrels a day or so of heating oil and oil that's burned for power across the US, North America, Europe, and Asia. And it looks like heating oil and fuel oil demand has been down materially this winter. And so I think when OPEC was deciding not to cut earlier this year, and late last year, I mean, they, they couldn't have known that where there was going to be a warm winter. You just, the, the weather is unknown and they definitely couldn't have known that it would be a, let's say 10 year or 20 year unusual, unusually warm winter. And so I think that actually seems to have thrown off the oil market and it's not something people really talk about much. And so I think, I think OPEC wants to balance the market. I think they want higher prices. I think there's a decent chance that at some point Russia exports a lot less than they've been exporting. They're, they're talking about it again. They've talked about it every month for almost a year. So <laughs> eventually I think it happens. I don't know when and, and maybe fooled me 10 times. Shame on me at this point. But, you know, 
it, it does look like there, there are some real logistical issues for Russia. And then beyond that, I think if Russia can actually cut their production a little and their exports a little, I think OPEC will coordinate with them and cut their production a little more. So I think, I think there's just a little bit of, of uh, looseness in the market that was unexpected because of the weather and because of that heating oil and fuel oil. And otherwise, I mean, things look great. China's reopening, you know, demand for aviation is way up, uh, you know, for, for flights, demand for just mobility generally in the US, Europe, Asia. It's been surprising to the upside for the most part. Uh, diesel's been a little weak because the overall sort of uh, the U.S. economy has been a little weak. Europe's been pretty weak, too. So so that's hurting. And and there are fewer cargo ships right now because cargo rates are so low and there's just not as much demand. So that's a little bit negative. But I think that was all sort of planned for and accounted for in the prior OPEC cuts. It's just I think the big surprise has just been this uh, warm weather. And as we get weather normalization or just move past the season where there would have been this heating oil and fuel oil burn, I think we could see the market tighten. And I think the exciting thing is that we could see the market tighten and more demand in China for jet fuel and see Russia cut exports and Saudi Arabia and several other countries cut their their supply to, to, to coincide with Russia. And they can point to this period of several months of pretty weak prices and say, hey, you know, we think the market might be oversupplied. And that could be a setup for a significant move in oil prices higher middle to later this year. But that's just one scenario. And it's possible that other things end up happening. Well, that's a great conversation. I really appreciate your time. If you were to leave the average investor or any investor out there interested in energy with some advice, how would you advise them to take advantage of the current energy cycle nowadays? That's a great question. I think it's just the aphorism, you know, uh, be uh, greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And, you know, I think it's just, it's wild how different the sentiment can shift and how much it shifted even in just the last few years in both directions. And, you know, I think there's always going to be people panicking when things look bad. And there's always going to be people who are exulting when things are good. And, you know, I think doing a little bit of the opposite can be really healthy, both in oil and gas, as well as uh, as a general investor. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate your insights on energy and everything else. And well, I guess we can leave it there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking.